Okay, so what is the meteorite engine? Well, it's a V8 petrol engine and it was built by Rover and it's going in a Land Rover, so absolutely none of that hasn't been done before. But if you want to know a bit about the origins of this engine and the history of it, you need to look over here. More specifically, the Rolls-Royce Merlin. Probably the most famous aero engine ever made and um, first conceived in 1933, first flew in an aircraft in 1937. And during World War II, Rolls-Royce developed a version of this engine derated, minus its supercharger, to power tanks, including the Cromwell. And it was in a meeting at the Swan and Wild Hotel in Clitheroe in December 1942, where Ernest Hyde, general manager of Rolls-Royce, and Maurice Wilkes, the managing director of the Rover Car Company, came to a deal whereby Rover ended up with Rolls-Royce's tank engine factory and took over production of this. They'd had an on-off relationship with Frank Whittle in developing the jet engine, and Hives realised that if they didn't get into the jet game pretty quickly, they were going to be missing out, and it kind of suited everybody that way. The 12-cylinder engine for army tanks was called the Meteor, and it shared all the common components with this Merlin. Um, it had a revised crankcase, because the Merlin drives its propeller here at approximately half engine speed, and with military vehicles, you would just want to drive straight under the crankshaft into a clutch. Um, but it used basically the same cylinders, the same cylinder heads, um, the crankshaft, which you'll see in a minute, the connecting rods and pistons were all basically the same. They changed the camshaft profile because they wanted more torque and lower RPM for a tank. It had a slightly lower maximum RPM. And they produced anywhere up to 650 horsepower um, with the carburetor fuel system and fuel injected later on made over 800 um, and they kind of most of the time were looking at a maximum rpm of near 2500 rpm as opposed to the merlin's 3000 but the merlin has a long duration camshaft profile which means basically it's working in the top sort of um, 30 percent of its rpm range all the time it's in the air and that's why they want the power um, when they designed the v8 engine um, from Meteor, the focus group were obviously in a hurry to get home that day when they were naming it because they just called it the Meteorite, logical enough, and it uses again the same components. Now, because the cylinder blocks are only four cylinders long, they're a different casting, but they are, again, as you'll see, exactly the same, exactly the same exhaust ports, including the stud pattern, um, and the same, more importantly, 60 degree V angle which gives it an uneven firing order, as we'll see. So here we've got a crankshaft and connecting rod assembly from the Meteor V12 engine. It has the same fork and blade connecting rod assembly as the Merlin, so you have a big end shell there, you can just see the bronze shells, and then within it is the oscillating connecting rod that serves the other bank of the engine, and um, the same components from a Merlin actually here. Um, the pistons look the same. In actual fact, on a Merlin, the pistons were forged, which is something you do on high-performance engines because they're stronger, and these engines run on boost. Of course, the Meteor wasn't supercharged. And here's one of the exhaust valves. Even in the Meteor and the Meteorite, they are sodium-cooled, which is, again, um, something you tend to find in higher-performance engines. Um, and the sodium becomes a liquid at 90 degrees centigrade, and the operation of the valve opening and closing causes the um, sodium as a liquid to jump or to flow up and down the hollow stem of the valve and carry heat away from the valve head itself. So looking at the crankcase and cylinder block of the Merlin, um, underneath the exhaust port here you can see one of the spark plug cables um, and there are two plugs per cylinder which is standard practice on aircraft and they carried this over to the military vehicle engines as well and they all had dual ignition systems. Again looking at the same area on the Meteorite V8 engine you can see the plugs there and the exhaust stud pattern being the same. Just a four cylinder block basically as opposed to a six cylinder. While the V-12 Meteor powered the army tanks, 
This engine was used to power the Thornycroft Antar tank transporter which carried them and it was good from the point of view of having a commonality of parts. Um, the Antar could have a gross train weight of just over 100 tonnes in some instances. Um, certainly the Cromwell tank was getting on for 50 tonnes on its own. Um, and this had a top speed of 28 miles an hour. Um, it was also 11 feet wide, so it's a huge truck. And probably what you'd class as the opposite end of the spectrum to uh, a Land Rover. But there you go. So here's the meteorite, which we'll call the big block Rover V8. Um, up against what you'd normally um, consider to be a Rover V8 engine, which is a 3.5 litre 90 degree V8, which means the angle between the two banks of cylinders is 90 degrees. Um, it's a bit difficult to tell here, but this is 60 degrees, this V8. Um, the reason you have 90 degrees on a V8 engine is for a four stroke engine, it requires two revolutions to complete its four stroke cycle. And basically, when you divide that down into eight, the cylinders need to be 90 degrees apart to get an even firing order. Not all engines by any means have an even firing order, and um, this is one of them. I mean, a Harley Davidson is a good example where two cylinders fire quite close together, then you get a fairly long gap between them and they fire again. Um, the way I like to think of this engine, um, particularly because of its lineage, is it's really a V12 engine with four cylinders removed or two cylinders removed from each bank. And a cylinder will fire on one bank and then 60 degrees later, a cylinder fires on the opposite bank. Then there's a longer gap. So instead of firing at 120 degrees, it actually then fires after 180 degrees and then fires another 60 degrees later than that at 240. So basically you get two cylinders firing let's say close together, then a longer gap and then another two firing close together. And you certainly do get vibration from this engine caused by that. Um, you get a lot of diesel engines, very large ones um, in ships and the like, which are 60 degrees and they can have any number of cylinders from four right up to 18 typically. And um, they tend to put balancer shafts in those engines. They definitely put balance shafts in a 60 degree V8 um, in, in many instances. Um, however, under load, you know, under very high power, the vibration isn't as bad as I half expected it to be on this engine. So I think, you know, using the right engine mountings will sort that one out. So here's a couple of interesting comparisons. This Rover V8 has a cylinder bore of 89 millimeters and the Merlin piston you see sitting in it there is 137. So you can see that obviously the meteorite V8 is going to be a lot longer than this. But in actual fact, the cylinders are very close together, um, mainly because it's based on an aircraft engine. So it's not as much longer as you would expect it to be. And I've had a tape measure across this because although this Rover V8 looks considerably smaller than, than the big one, um, in actual fact, what you're looking at there is the crankcase. So you're not looking at the top of the engine there. Um, the top of the crankcase, or the top of the cylinder blocks underneath the heads, are somewhere behind that silver pipe you see running across the middle of the engine. And I've had a tape measure on there. On the Rover V8, the width of the block there is um, 18 inches, and on the meteorite it was only 21, so it's not as much bigger as you think. Um, lengthwise, of course, there is quite a big difference between them in length. Um, a 60 degree V engine is narrower. Um, for the same capacity and um, that can be useful um, particularly in an aircraft because you want it to be as narrow as possible for aerodynamics. Um, in the case of this one it's narrower but it's also quite a lot taller than the Rover V8 engine even if it was the same capacity it would generally still be a bit taller um, and it's a tight fit into the Land Rover whichever way you look at it. It would probably be quicker to list the parts of this engine which are standard rather than those which are modifications to it. Um, in order to get it to fit into the Land Rover chassis, um, it was really a question of removing any weight that I could from it and any length. And it had a really nice gearbox on this end of the engine which drove the magneto ignitions, the camshafts, the fuel pumps, the oil pumps and the water pump. That had to come off 
and it was cast iron. The rest of the engine is all aluminium. Again, because it's an aircraft engine design. And the camshafts are now driven by a belt, which is in modern terms, a backward step actually. Um, but in terms of this engine, which isn't gonna do thousands of hours of running, no problem at all. Uh, it's lighter um, and doesn't take up as much room. Um, the distributors are now on the ends of the camshaft because it's an overhead cam engine. And this is where you can see what I was referring to before about thinking of it in terms of being a 12 cylinder with four cylinders missing. Um, you can see the uh, plug cables there, but you can also see every two, there's another one missing, which is your four missing cylinders from the V12. I bet you can't go and buy an eight cylinder distributor with those angles in it for a 60 degree engine. There might have been one or two car engines over the years, perhaps that have used this um, um, principle. Certainly the distributors that were in the magnetos on this engine worked in exactly the same way. So the terminals inside them are not equally spaced. And so you just use a Jaguar V12 distributor and it doesn't spark through those four missing um, terminals because this is running on an ECU and it's just timed that way. So the ECU is set up in order to provide the sparks at the angles that I mentioned before. Um, originally the engine had carburettors, it had two 46 millimeter Solex carbs mounted on one end of each cylinder block, just two carbs in total. Um, and all sorts of things about the engine and the way it runs are completely different. Um, it had a governor and it was governed to 2000 RPM. Um, it had a six to one compression ratio, the same as the Merlin engine. Um, this engine is now seven to one and it's fuel injected. Um, it runs on this ECU down here, which is a fantastic thing called a FuelTech um, FT600. And I'll do another video all about that because it's just amazing. I mean, what I've said about that product is that if everything that came onto the market was as well finished as that, we'd be laughing. <laughs> we just would. It, and, you know, not in amusement because it's fantastic. Um, and it has fuel rails, which you can see just here, and fuel injectors. Just the same as you would see on a modern car engine, the only difference being that they are 2.2 litres a minute maximum flow rate. Um, and the, there's a throttle body, one here and one on the other side of the engine, feeding into a common plenum down the middle of the V there and out through these induction pipes, um, which you can see on the top. And I was just able to get the bare minimum length of induction pipe that you can really get away with. Um, had I had the luxury of loads of space, I could have made them a lot longer and that would have boosted the low end torque. Um, however, I've found that it's making 650 pounds feet of torque at 400 RPM. So let's not go there. Anyway, we don't want to rip the gearbox out of it. <laughs> so we still needed some kind of gearbox on the front of the engine or what you'd normally refer to as a timing case. Um, and in this particular instance, it's quite a, a slim gear train and um, it's got the, the crankshaft pickup wheel there for the ECU. That's quite a large pickup wheel, it's 125 millimeters. And that's because this engine turns over fairly slowly um, on the starter motor. So because of the way in which the variable reluctance pickup works, it actually requires a certain speed of teeth passing it um, to get a good signal. Underneath there we've got the oil pressure pump and on the other side are the twin oil scavenge pumps because as with the aircraft engine it's dry sump which is absolutely brilliant when you want to put it in a vehicle because you've got a fairly flat sump and that proved quite useful on this one in order to clear the front axle. Um, even though it's a two-wheel drive vehicle the axle still has to clear this engine. There's another shaft at the top there which is the only power takeoff from the engine other than the obvious one at the other end. Um, and this is just to drive the alternator. Um, and it's quite a big alternator because everything on this is electric apart from that. You've got on the vehicle electric power steering and it's got electric coolant pumps as well and electric fans and um, all the fuel pumps and the ADI system pumps are all electric. Um, so it just has a high current draw on it, but it means that we haven't got to put pulleys and belts everywhere on the engine. <laughs> 
The fuel injection system is supplied by twin 044 fuel pumps and at the front end of the engine here is the fuel pressure regulator. Above it there is an electronic pressure sensor and there's also a mechanical fuel pressure gauge line coming off it and that then returns all the fuel back to the tank so it's basically circulating at a constant pressure all the time. And the way the fuel injection works is it just opens the injectors at the required time for the required length of time according to all the information being processed by the ECU. So the more power and the more RPM you want, the longer the injectors would open for. And the injectors are also timed in the same way as the ignition, so that they're putting the fuel in at the correct amount for every four stroke cycle while the inlet valve's actually open. Um, <clears throat> And there's all sorts of stuff down in between the V here, as well as the plenum. There are temperature sensors. And there are also, as I mentioned earlier, another set of eight spark plugs. And I'm really quick to criticize um, manufacturers for making things that you can't get at. And um, I, I've won quite a decent prize here in that case, because you have to take the entire induction system off this thing. So the intake spark plugs obviously aren't gonna be getting looked at as often. Um, when they went from the Merlin to the Meteor army tank engine, um, that is also quite difficult um, for access to the intake spark plugs, as anybody that's worked on them would um, testify. Um, it's difficult. They had carburettors in between the V. This thing's got a great big air plenum in the middle of it. Um, I'm just going to have to lump it. I can't sort of improve on that design. There's one more feature on the induction system, which is this manifold and tubes here. Each one of these feeds one of eight um, atomizing injectors, and they're fed from two electric pumps with a 50-50 mix of water and methanol alcohol. Um, it's called ADI, um, which is anti-detonant injection, and basically it's to reduce the temperature of the incoming charge. Um, anybody who's put their finger over the end of a bicycle pump or a compressed air line before we were told you're not allowed to do that because it puts air into your bloodstream and causes an embolism will know that it gets hot. So the compressed air coming out of this um, turbocharger compressor, um, at the moment at 7 psi I'm seeing temperatures going into the engine of about 90 degrees centigrade. Um, <clears throat> so as the boost pressure is increased uh, it gets to a point where the temperature of the incoming charge mixed with the fuel and then combined with the additional compression of the piston coming up the bore cause the fuel to ignite um, or partially ignite before the spark plug ignites it um, in much the same way as a diesel engine would run um, and that's called knock. So as you start to get towards the knock point of the, the boost pressure and the particular type of fuel that you're using because that has an effect as well you then have to use intercoolers normally. Um, the problem with this setup in the Land Rover was simply one of space. Um, intercooler radiators are by far um, the best approach. Um, but in this instance, I'm using the same technique that was used on the Rolls-Royce Griffin 58 engine, which is just a larger capacity than the Merlin. Um, the Griffin 58 ran 25 pounds of boost with a 50-50 water methanol injection system and no intercooler. There were other differences in that fuel system, but you can replicate the same thing on here. Um, and when you want to make even more power with an engine like this, you do away with your fuel injectors and your petrol injection system altogether, and you can actually run them on methanol, which brings your detonation point right back, and you can run a lot more boost with them, typically 50 PSI. So that's the ADI system. At the moment, I'm not running it, it's not connected. Um, seven PSI, um, I think I'm getting peaks of about 8 psi, um, around 10 we'll be getting to the point, um, certainly from other people's experience, um, where we'll be reaching detonation. So um, if anything higher than where I am now, I need to start connecting that system in. And we can't finish talking about the uh, fuel and induction system on this thing without talking about the elephants in the room. Um, which are the turbos on either side of the engine and actually the maximum width of this whole setup is pretty much getting on for the same width as the Land Rover itself. That's okay because these turbos fit under the wings um, of the vehicle and the front wheels sit underneath them quite nicely um, and they allow for suspension travel and steering and so on. So 
um, in actual fact they're not in the engine bay in that respect. Um, these are Borg Warner S467s um, which basically means they have a 67 millimeter compressor inducer which is a diameter of the hole going into the compressors. They have a wastegate system on them which is under here and currently with the testing we're doing at the moment that wastegate opens to atmosphere but that will be plumbed into the exhaust system and they open and they've basically got a valve you can just see it under there it's a puppet valve just like the valve on um, inside an engine um, and they open to give you a maximum pressure from the turbos of 7 psi um, which is how i've been running it so far um, ultimately we put a boost control on those which is connected into the sensing line and the ecu can then set the boost pressure at anything above 7 psi it can't set it any lower um, and it does it by bleeding off air between the um, the induction system and the wastegate valve um, and the ultimately this engine can run it up to 25 psi um, to give somewhere in the region of 1300 to um, 1400 brake horsepower um, this turbo has if we look around the front here it has an RF speed probe on it and um, part of the reason for that is they're matched quite well to the engine but particularly if you're making very high pressures at the maximum RPM of the engine we need to make sure that we're still certainly within not only the compressor map um, which is the efficient area of, um, of boost pressure generation but also that they're not exceeding their maximum design RPM. Um, which for these turbos is somewhere in the region of 120,000 RPM. So you don't want to go over, um, over that really at all. Um, I have a um, device on either side as well called a dump valve there, which basically takes the pressure away from the compressor discharge when you close the throttle. The throttle body's there, the same on the other side of the engine, it's all duplicated. When the engine's making a lot of pressure, um, you shut that throttle immediately just by taking your foot off the accelerator and that turbocharger there is just pushing into a dead end. So um, it stalls it basically. Um, this thing on the other hand will open and allow that, um, that air to discharge. Um, and one of the reasons for it is, is simply um, keeping um, or preventing the turbos from lagging when you go back on the throttle again because the, um, the rotor will virtually stop when it's pumping against a dead end because it's doing a lot of work. On the back end of the engine, because this engine only runs to 3000 RPM maximum, one of the issues you have with them is torque because for every horsepower it produces, if it's producing it at half the RPM of a car engine, which it pretty much is when it's flat out, it's going to be making double the torque. So um, what we do on here is, this is an overdrive. Now an overdrive would normally be on the back of a gearbox um, to provide you with a more comfortable cruising RPM on an engine. Um, <clears throat> this particular overdrive is straight on the back of the engine, so instead of the flywheel being in there, the flywheel, or in the case of this one, it's a, it's a flex plate because it's an automatic transmission. The flex plate's back there, which is great because it gives us room to put the starter motor down the side. And the sort of size of flywheel to get the starter motor down the side of that crankcase there, you're talking in the order of 500 millimetres. Um, and it causes all sorts of issues, not only for space, um, but, you know, ring gears and you can still only just get the thing down the side with the biggest ring gear that you can realistically buy for a truck um, all sorts of problems like that um, this overdrive uses an allison um, planetary gear set out of uh, an automatic transmission from a truck which is capable of handling sort of somewhere in the region of 2000 pounds feet um, and then the rest of it is our dynamometer um, huge prop shaft there um, torsional coupling, that device there takes the firing pulses away to a certain extent and uh, gives the dynamometer a smoother ride. Uh, the far end of the dynamometer has actually got its own starter which is what I've been using here um, and you can pretty much see there what, um, you, know, you get no scale but that's a 500mm flywheel made of steel because you've got a 1.6 to 1 step up ratio 
inside this overdrive on the back of here. So at 3000 RPM on the engine, um, the output shaft on this is sort of kicking out somewhere um, north of 4,500 certainly. Um, the total mass of that shaft, that damper, and the rotors inside this dynamometer are somewhere in the order of 300 kilograms, running at sort of the best part of 5,000 RPM. And you'll notice this when I shut the engine down, or if you've watched any of the videos that are being tested, you can kind of gauge when I've turned the ignition off. It runs from 1,000 RPM, it runs for about 10 to 15 seconds before the engine stops. And I can tell you from having run it without the dyno connected that it pretty much stops dead when you knock it off without this lot. So there's a hell of a lot of energy in that dynamometer. Um, when it's running at high speed, um, and even when it's uh, ticking over. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this short overview of what this engine's all about, um, its history, how it originated. Um, and if this kind of thing interests you, then please subscribe to this channel, then you'll get updates when we're testing the engine further, when it goes into the vehicle, and finally when it goes out onto the road. Um, it's freezing here, it's three degrees today. So let's fire this baby up and put some warmth into this workshop because it's the only heater I've got. <laughs>